Uh, what should we talk about? Um, so, what are some, uh, I want to actually interact with some of the youth at this point. I don't really want to give a speech. I did that yesterday. I'm kind of bored of that. So, um, what are some of the issues that you all, as youth, are experiencing in school? I assume many of you go to public school. Ah, oh, yes, sister with the pink hijab. Um. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, thank you for your comment. She made a comment that many of her, many of the people at her school, they think she's very dumb, right? Because a lot of children, unfortunately, you know, children, um, they're not fully developed intellectually. Right? You'll notice uh, you, when you get to college, and people start thinking very differently because people, you know, they can think for themselves. And, uh, so that's, thank you for your comment. That's something that happened to me actually when I was in elementary school as well. Um, and at that time, I didn't even identify as Muslim. If you asked me in sixth grade, are you Muslim? I would say, no, I'm not. Right? I didn't want anything to do with Islam when I was that old. Um, and it's kind of because uh, not only was there no Islamic practice in my home, but everything I knew about Islam was just through television. So watching TV and, oh my goodness, you know, this is what they're saying. Well, I don't want to be that. So a lot of these children that are, that are saying that to you, um, it's just from a, a, a standpoint of being very ignorant. Now, if you feel like you're being bullied, you should always tell a teacher and don't be afraid of doing that. Right? Tell, tell the teacher, say they're calling me names, because schools should really have zero tolerance for that type of thing. And then also, are there other Muslims in your class? Um, oh, yeah. I, have, I have a friend named Sarah, Sarah and hmm. uh, another teacher called Sarah, and they're Muslim, but they don't want to be Muslim. Yeah. Um, That's good. Yeah, that's good. You know, be with the Muslim students. And also, you know, you can ask someone who says, you're stupid or you're dumb. Say, why, why do you say that? Give me an example of my stupidity, you know. And you can even show your report card and say, look, I have all A's. How am I stupid? Because there's really no, there's no basis for what they're saying, right? So I remember when I was in um, fifth grade, uh, this, uh, and my school was all non-Muslim. And everyone was Caucasian. They were all white, except my sister and I. So this uh, student, non-Muslim, and many people, they were very religious Christians. So one religious, very religious Christian, uh, he came to me and he said, are you Muslim? And I said, uh, no. And he said, but your name is, you have a Muslim name. <laughs> I said, oh, man. How did he know that? Uh, so I said, no, I uh, converted. To what? To Mormonism. It was the first religion to pop into my head. So I said I was a Mormon. And then he said, really? And then he went and he asked uh, the, an another student, a female student, who was sort of the, I don't know, sort of the student pastor, the most religious student in our class. And I heard him ask her, is someone allowed to change religions? And I was thinking the whole time, oh my God, please say yes. She said, yes, of course. And I said, oh, thank God. So from that point on, I was known as the Mormon. All right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, so I didn't actually start calling myself Muslim until I was about 15. And it was because uh, I um, came across someone named Malcolm X. I read his book. He wrote an autobiography. He died in 1965. So he, was, he died long before I was born. But I read his autobiography, and he was, you know, um, he was African-American who converted to Islam. He went to, ha he went to Mecca. He made the Hajj. And I was very impressed with his story. So 15 or so, I started calling myself a Muslim. I didn't actually start practicing. And I didn't have any resources, so I didn't have any Muslim friends. And that's the, that's the key, I think. Just be around Muslims. You know, al maru ala dini khalili. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he says, a person is upon the religion of his friends. 
right? A person is upon the religion of his friends. So, and then, you know, so be careful who you befriend. So obviously be friendly to everyone. Friendly to everyone, right? Even people that are not so friendly to us, we should show them friendliness. You don't have to make them your best friend. But you should be kind. You know, that's the sunnah. That's the way the Prophet used to interact with people. When people would be harsh with him, he would show them kindness, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean he would hang around with them. Right? Hang around with good people, with believers. So you have sort of an inner circle of very close friends that should be Muslim. Um, you know, people that, that, that pray, people that read Quran, people that believe in what you believe so you can learn from each other. You strengthen each other mutually, you know. Um, so uh, it's very, very important that when we're in these public schools, and you know, I obviously have experience in this, is to seek out these Muslims. Right, um, and and you know if people are making baseless claims that are name calling, then you can engage with them. And one of the things that I don't suggest doing is sort of just cowering away and being afraid and and hiding it and not telling anyone. Because if you show fear, oftentimes children will that will sort of encourage children to keep doing it. Like, I can get away with this, right? I have power over this person. So the next day they'll say something even, even more crazy. But if you say, if you, you know, challenge them initially and say, why are you calling me stupid? What's stupid about me? Right? They'll be like, what? Well, I, I don't know. Because you're Muslim. So what's stupid about Islam? And they won't have an answer. They don't know anything. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, people don't know anything. I used to teach classes at the graduate school level. I used to teach um, Christians that were doing masters of divinity degrees, and they have to take a, a class on Islam. You know, so these are going to be Christian scholars, and uh, a room full of Christians. And I would say, um, I said, who, who knows what the Kaaba is? And nobody would raise their hand, not one person. So what? Kaaba? What's that? So I said, you know that black cube? And about half the people go, oh yeah, I know what that is. And I said, you know who built that? Nobody raises their hand. And I said, you know, uh, Abraham, he, he raised the foundations. And I say, oh really? I mean, something so basic. It's so basic, right? But, you know, graduate students don't know that. And so imagine, you know, children, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they don't really know anything. You know, they're just sort of uh, repeating what they sort of hear on television. So if we take an intellectual stance and say, well, you know, prove it to me that Islam is stupid or I'm stupid, they won't know how to say anything. And that will discourage them from actually talking to you again because they don't want to look foolish and not have an answer. You know, I also encourage students, you know, when you get home from school, do something fun. You know, um, don't have, you know, Facebook accounts at this age. You know, when, when, I, when I get bullied, when I used to get bullied in school, I would come home and it was a really safe uh, space for me, right? And, you know, was, uh, that's when the bullying stopped and I would go and I was a soccer player, I play football, I do martial arts, I hang out with my dad, you know, watch, watch a sports game or something. But nowadays, you know, students that engage in social media, they go home and they, you know, get on their Facebook and they're still being picked on. So it's a 24 hour cycle. And, you know, that's too much for children uh, to, to bear. And when I say children, I mean even in high school. You know, I wouldn't get a, a Facebook account until I was in college. I didn't get an iPhone until I was 39 years old, which I just got it, by the way. I had a flip phone until a couple of years ago. Then I got somewhat of a hybrid kind of smartphone type of thing, but I never used it for internet or anything like that. So this is really the first time in my life I'm using my phone for internet at 39 years old. Because um, you don't, really don't need that. You, you, you could have, you have your email account and just, you know, you can use it from a computer. So I think limiting engagement in social media for youth is extremely important, you know. Oftentimes what happens again is, you know, the child will come home from a rough day at school, people calling him stupid and things like that because he's Muslim. And then they'll turn on Facebook, oh, they're, they're still making fun of. So they get into this type of, type of depression. 
So that's that's um, that's important. Um, and also, you know, sort of a message to the parents as well is that you know, your your child should feel uh, very comfortable coming to you with issues. I can't tell you how many youth have come to me, and these are usually in high school, that come to me and tell me things that uh, should be reported to schools and possibly even be um, uh, uh, pursued um, by authorities, things that are happening to them in school. And I say, well, did you tell your father? And he says, no, my dad will kill me. I say, well, it's not your fault. So yeah, but my dad, you know, he, he, you know, he doesn't like any type of conflict. I mean, there was a student who said that he literally has to ditch a class every day. I think it was his math class. So he hasn't gone to his math class in weeks because there's a certain student there who, who physically attacks him in, in class. So he said, I'm failing that class now. So did you tell your father, no, 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 you know, he, he won't even care that I'm getting attacked. He just cares about my grades, you know. So, uh, so children have to feel comfortable with their parents. Uh, and, you know, you should also think about maybe <clears throat> having some sort of mentor for your children, someone who's not exactly as old as you are, right? So they're not, you know, they're not an uncle. They're, they're kind of, they're not a, they're not a child, but they're sort of in the middle, right? So a mentor, a few years older than your, than your child, that they can speak to, they, they can be more comfortable with. Um, so, uh, having a youth halakha, you know, a youth halakha, bring in dynamic speakers, you know, people that know how to speak to youth, so that in the halakha, you know, they, the children have this outlet to voice their opinions about certain things. We used to have a youth halakha years ago, and, uh, you know, 200 people would come into the masjid, and they'd ask me questions they would never ask their parents. You know, and that was good. You know, that's that's something that they needed. Like, you know, kids coming up to me and saying, "Can I get a tattoo?" I said, "No, you can't do that." Oh, okay, thank God I asked you because I almost did it, and I was going to hide it from my father. <laughs> you know, so have a youth halakha. Give, give children, give children the ability to be in contact with with people that are closer to their age and understand the society. And oftentimes, as parents, you know, we come from different countries, we don't really understand. We might think we do, but we really don't understand what's happening in the society, especially in public school, because we didn't go to public school. I went to public school, so I understand what's happening. Uh, so I would say that's very important. Limit social media as much as possible until you get to college. You don't need an iPhone. You know, have a phone if you're in high school, you know, in case there's an emergency or something like that. You don't need internet on your phone until you're in college. Um, and this is for our own good, I think. Uh, there was another hand up here somewhere. Hassan. Who is it? Hassan. Hassan. Yeah. You, have a, you have an issue? Um, uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Some people uh, mock my name. Hmm. What's your name? Muhammad. Oh, subhanAllah. You know what you can say? You can say, my name is the most popular name in the world. And it's true. The name Muhammad is the most popular name in the world. So you say, why are you walking, mocking my name? It's the most popular name. And they won't know what to say. And that's, that's the truth. The name Muhammad is the most popular name in England. <laughs> yeah. Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ Allah says to the Prophet when he was the only Muhammad on the planet, Allah says to him, we have, we have elevated your dhikr, your remembrance. So one of the meanings of that is that, uh, is that this name will be the most popular name in the world. This is a prophecy. Uh, so that, that actually happened. Um, so what you don't want to do is mock other people's names. Just give them an answer like, it's the most popular name in the world. You didn't know that, right? But if you, if you mock their names, and that's what we can't do. So we can't return an evil for an evil, right? So if somebody insults you, then you can't insult them, but you can stand up for yourself. So the answer isn't to sort of go, oh, ah. that's not the answer. And the answer isn't also, what's your name, Brad? That sounds like rad or something. <laughs> <laughs> So that's not the answer either. But the answer is to take, take a stance, but make it intellectual. 
So why are you making fun of my name? It's the most popular name in the world. There are more people with my name than your name. So you should really learn what my name means. Yes, sir. Hassan. Uh, this is not really my problem, but there's a lot of people in my school who like, it's like, I don't want to be all inappropriate or something, but they get sexually abused. Really? Mm -hmm. By who? By like, but like their own, their, their own friends, because they like, you know, peer pressuring them to do like drugs and stuff. They get sexually abused? I mean, not sexually abused, more like, um. like sexually encountered or something. I don't know. Maybe harassed? Mean. They get harassed. Yes, harassed. Like the girls are getting harassed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you see something like that, you should always tell a school administrator. Okay. Even if you think, oh, that's okay. If there's even a, an inkling, a little thought in your mind that this is inappropriate, you should tell someone about that. Because oftentimes girls in schools, um, things like that happen. And, you know, the girl doesn't want to sort of... Uh, embarrass herself, I guess, and tell someone about that. So she'll let things slide. But really, that should be cut off immediately. You know, so tell a school administrator if you see something like that. Um, and that's unfortunate, you know. And then, you know, if you see someone, if, that, if that's happening to someone, whether they're a boy or a girl, you know, speak to them and say, you know, I saw what happened, and I think we should, we should tell a teacher or an administrator about that. So don't be afraid to engage with teachers and administrators. They're there to help you. You know, sometimes we think, oh, they're mean and things like that, but really, they're there to help us. Yes? I once got told at school that Muslim, I, that like, this kid said, I hate, I hate, I hate Muslims and Muslims are bad. Yeah. So I say, why do you hate people? Hatred is bad, right? He said that, I asked him that, and he said that because he was, a Trump supporter and that, uh, that his whole church loves Trump. You could say there are Muslims who support Trump. What do you say about that? There are Muslims who voted for Trump. That's true. There are? Yeah, of course. You know what's interesting is a lot of the... I don't even know if I can explain this. Um, Muslims politically actually lean more to the right towards conservatism than the left. If you look at some of our issues with like marriage and abortion and things like that, that's more right-leaning, right? Um, you know, Trump didn't, didn't want to go to war in Iraq. I totally agree with him. So this idea that, you know, I, we support Trump, therefore we are the, the antithesis of everything Islamic is just a false narrative. You know, you can say that. You can say, what about Muslims who voted for Trump? You know, so, and then also remind people, it's, you know, hating, hating people, you know, if they're Christian, you can remind them that, you know, it, it's very, un, it's very unchristian behavior to hate people. So you're really not following the example set down by Jesus Christ, you know, and if you say something like that, he's going to be sort of taken aback by it. Um, but... Uh, uh, just remind people that, you know, hating people is, is, is not a good state of mind to be in. And you can actually tell that person, you know, I feel bad for you that you hate. And let me pray for you. And that's going to sort of resonate with them, I think. Yes? So, actually, last week I found out a girl was smuggling alcohol into the school. And I told on her and got expelled, but then the next day, a bunch of people were telling me, no, that's wrong, why would you do that, you bully? Even though I was doing the right thing, and what she was doing was clearly illegal. Yeah, yeah, so it, you're, I agree with you, you were doing the right thing. So don't worry about what people say to you after that, because you did the right thing. Obviously, whatever, you can do, you can feed a, a million homeless people and there's always going to be someone that's going to say, well, I don't think you did the right thing. There's always going to be critics. And that's what we have to understand. You can do your best and try to please everyone, but you'll never please everyone. So the most important thing for us is to have a good intention and try to please God. That's it. And if we, if we try to please God, we might please a few people, we might not, but that's not our concern. Right? So if you see something wrong, you did the right thing. So don't worry about how people criticize you because that is absolutely illegal. And you might have saved someone's life. You know, people, young children drinking alcohol. 
there's alcohol poisoning, you know, they might, you know, do something stupid and, and fall or get behind the wheel of a car and get into a car accident. So definitely you did the right thing. So don't worry about people that criticize after that point. Yes, sir. Uh, there are multiple multiple times in schools where people call me a school shooter and whenever I say something that was not against the left, like li something for liberalism, they always keep on booing me in schools. What hmm. am I supposed to do that? So they expect you to speak out against the left? Uh, yeah, a lot of them do. Okay. Well, the whole issue of the school shooter, <coughs> you can remind them of history. Do you, know, do you know about the Columbine shooting? Yeah. Yeah, just remind them. So, you know, the Columbine shooters is probably the most famous school shooting other than the Sandy Hook massacre. N neither one of those, there were three shooters total. They were not Muslim. You know, so ask them, like, what do you mean that I'm a school shooter? Because, you know, and you have to learn these names. Adam Lanza, Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris. Those are the names of the shooters. I memorize them. You should memorize them. So when you name drop like that, they say, oh, this guy, he knows his stuff. He's serious. I better shut my mouth because he's coming to me with facts, right? And I'm just insulting him. So oftentimes kids will back off if they hear that. And if they don't back off, just keep repeating the same line. So have you heard of Adam Lanza, Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris? Say so no. Have you heard of... Um, uh, what was the, the Oak Creek, Wisconsin shooter? Now I'm blanking on his name. Um, uh, you should learn these names. I'm, for, I'm forgetting some of the names right now. Um, and so, you know, none of these shooters were Muslim. You know, uh, Wade Michael Page. Wade Michael Page was um, a Christian. He was in the Aryan Nation, which is a terrorist organization. It's a Christian terrorist organization in America, but according to the FBI. It's called the Aryan Nation. Uh, he went into a uh, Gurudwara temple, a Sikh temple, thinking they were Muslims. And he opened fire. He killed six people, right? Um, and uh, it's interesting, people justified what he did. Was, oh, he thought they were Muslim. That doesn't justify murder. So you should know these names. Wade Michael Page. Wade Page. Two syllables. Just let people hear these names. You know, and these are not Muslims. You have more, uh, there's more, there's more of a chance for you to be killed by slipping in the bathtub than, than being killed by a Muslim terrorist in America. This is absolutely true. There's more of a chance of you slipping in the bathtub, hitting your head and dying than being shot by a Muslim in America. This is absolutely true. There's more chance of you being killed by the police than being killed by an American Muslim terrorist. And that's not a slight against the police. You know, that's just a fact. Your own clothes kill you more often. The what? Uh, your own clothes kill you more often. Than your own clothes, yeah. There's more chance of you, there's more chance of being shot by a toddler. Children, they find their parents' guns every so often and they shoot and they kill, like, kill their siblings or kill their mother. There's more of a chance of that happening than you being killed by a Muslim in America. Wow. These are just the facts. So people, you have to put things in perspective for people. Right? So you have, to, you have to think, you have to be intellectual. Don't be swayed by emotion. Oftentimes, you know, people who pick on you, they want to get an emotional response out of you. So they say, you're a terrorist because your name's Muhammad. And then you say, shut up! They say, see, see, you're crazy, you're crazy. So engage with them intellectually. There's no answer from them. I guarantee you there's no answer. And if there is an answer, they'll, they'll notice that, oh, he's, he's willing to engage intellectually. So he'll take the discourse at a, at a higher level. Yes? What is the reason why people think Muslims are bad? Well, that's the perception that the, the media is projecting. You know? So uh, America invaded Muslim countries in the past uh, under false pretense. Right. So in 2003, Iraq was invaded because we were told that they had weapons of mass destruction. So it was sort of a uh, preemptive strike, but it turns out there were no weapons. 
but the war continues. So the war isn't really for weapons of mass destruction. There's other things happening there. So th this, is, this is something that a lot of Americans find very disturbing. Like, why are we invading these countries? So in order to justify these uh, illegal wars, these unjust wars, a lot of propaganda is pumped through the media to brainwash people into thinking, well, you know, these Muslims are bad people. Muslims are bad. They say, well, it, it, no, it's radical Islam. Radical Muslims are bad. And they are bad. But a lot of times people don't, they can't differentiate, especially children. Radical Islam and just regular Muslims. I mean, I get questions from college students. College students, you know, is there a difference between ISIS and the rest of the Muslims? Well, of course. How, why would you think there isn't, right? Uh, but they can't differentiate. So what's coming from the media, you know, what's coming from... Uh, uh, um, like news channels and things like that, what they're reporting. A lot of it is sort of aggrandized. It's made bigger than it is. For example, this instance, instance here, where a child literally believes that a Muslim um, uh, is very likely to come into a school and start shooting people. It's so unbelievably unlikely, we shouldn't even have to worry about it even that much. But that's what his perception is because he's listening to the news. Because the news, again, is trying to justify American foreign policy. And it's okay for us to criticize. You know Thomas Jefferson? Yeah. Thomas Jefferson said, uh, he said, dissent is the greatest form of patriotism. Dissent means disagreement. And he's talking about with the government, right? Dissent is the greatest form of patriotism. Uh, so we're allowed to criticize. That doesn't make you un-American. In fact, you know, if you really love something, if you really love someone and they're hurting themselves, you're not, you're not gonna just go ahead and let them hurt themselves. You're gonna try to give that person advice because you love them. You want to fix them, you want to correct them. Maybe they take advice, maybe they don't. The point is we have to engage in an academic, civil way, not by name calling, Right? Not by losing our tempers, um, not by any type of violence whatsoever. So the Prophet in Mecca is very important. So our situation is kind of like the Muslims in Mecca. Right? We're a minority in a non-Muslim land. Um, but this is our country as well, so don't forget that. We are as American as anybody else. Uh, America is a land of immigrants. Everyone came from somewhere, unless you're a Native American. Right? But the prophet in Mecca, his, uh, his stance was uh, what's known as assertive nonviolence. So you should remember these terms, assertive nonviolence. This is a term that Martin Luther King used to use. Assertive nonviolence is different than passive nonviolence. Passive nonviolence means I'm a doormat and you can step all over me and spit on me and I'm just going to go cower in the corner and cry. So that's, that's not a good state. The Prophet said a Muslim is never humiliated but is always humble. So the difference between being humiliated and being humble. Right? So assertive nonviolence is you don't, you're not violent at all. No violence whatsoever. But you are a principled person. You have principles, right? You believe in God. You believe in the Prophet You're not afraid of praying. You don't care if people criticize you because you have principles. You, you don't hurt people's feelings, right? But you, have, you take a stance because you're a principled person. You know, a man, for, a man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. That's what Malcolm X said. So you're not violent, but you have principles. And you, can, and you want to share those principles with people because we want to engage with people intellectually. right? So that's what we have to do. A lot of non-Muslims, they're getting their information about Islam from these mainstream media outlets. So they're being told, what is jihad? Oh, jihad is war against infidels, holy war against infidels. No, it's, that's not what it is. We have our own definitions. You know, so when people define our terms, uh, then they will control discourse. When they control discourse, they'll tell our narrative. And if they tell our, our narrative, then they're the ones that are educating people or miseducating. So we have, to, we, have to, we have to define our own terms. We have to take our discourse where we want it to go, right? 
<clears throat> so that's, that's very important as well. A lot of people last night, they told me, I talked to several non-Muslims last night, and they said, you know, we weren't even sure you spoke English. I mean, that's just a perception. I don't really blame them. Or they said, we expected you to go up there and be like, okay, hello, um, today, yes, we're going to, you know, they had this big accent. And, so wait, you can speak English so well. So yeah, I was raised in America. Oh, really? Okay. A lot of people thought I was just going to go up there and just badmouth America. So they were very defensive. I can see their faces. Right? And then I say something, go, oh, okay. And then they go, oh, all right. And then they go, oh, oh my God. <laughs> yes? Uh, what's the floor for fifth grade? When we were in PE playing volleyball, this, there's this really jerky kid named Jack Humphrey. I hated his guts back then. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Humphrey. Yeah, yeah. He, literally, when we were in the middle of volleyball, he literally called me a terrorist, which which got me so mad I told the teacher on him. That's good. They didn't do anything about it. Then tell somebody else. If, if your teacher doesn't do something about it, tell another teacher. And if they don't do something about it, tell someone else. And then go to the vice principal, and then go to the principal. Well, all they did was just tell him, don't do it again. But he just kicked on bad mouth. And you have to keep telling on him. Keep telling on him until something's done. And you can actually go home to your parents. Don't be afraid to talk to your parents. And so he, so he and, just made a parody of his name, which is very effective. He stopped calling me. Yeah. I'm joking. I'm not, I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't have to say it. I think I know what it is. Um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually recommend doing that because, you know, because it's a breach of our ethics. You know? So don't insult people, even if they insult you, but stand up for yourself. Tell your parents, this person is calling me a terrorist and school administrators are doing nothing about it. And then your parents can go and demand to have a meeting with the parents of that child. And you'll be there and he'll be there too. And you can demand from him, I want you to apologize to me right now in front of his parents. And oftentimes that bully will go, ah, I'm sorry. And that's the end of it. <laughs> yes? Um, something that happens to me is that um, a kid who sometimes pushes me around the locker area, mm -hmm. and um, there's another kid, he, it was um, maybe, I don't know, maybe a year ago, but he started cursing, like saying like, a word and stuff. To you? Well, no, he just said it like right on yeah. Well, if you're being pushed again, if anyone's putting their hands on you, you have to tell a school administrator. Yeah, I did, but then the teacher um, was like, okay, next time it happens, call me again. And the, a different kid he called me Hitler. A different what? Hitler. Hit her? The Hitler. Oh, he called you Hitler? Yeah. You Hitler? <laughs> Oh, yeah, Hitler. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so a good response to that is, oh, I'm not a Catholic, you know, because Hitler was a Catholic. But, you know, if you just hear things, you know, we have to also learn how to just kind of tune things out as well. Yeah, that's what you know. Then, like, some days he, like, um, like the same kid he called, the same person who called me Hitler. Yeah. And he, like, sometimes curses, like, like he once yeah something like that you have to tell your parents you know tell the school administrator and then, and then immediately go home and tell your parents, because if a child puts his hands on you, he can be kicked out of school. He should be kicked out of school, you know. Uh, so we have to make an example out of students sometimes. Someone who, do, who does that, we have to make an example out of him. So if he's kicked out, other students will see, oh, he got kicked out of school for abusing another child. They'll think twice about doing that as well. So we, 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 we can't let physical violence go. Don't let that go. You know, I'm not saying hit back ever, but when, unless you have to, unless you know people are holding you down, they're punching you, and you have to defend yourself. But if it's a pick, kick and a punch, just kind of to annoy you or bully you, you have to tell an administrator and go home and tell your parents. And your parents should demand a meeting with the principal and the parents of that child. 
right? And demand, if that doesn't happen, that the child be kicked out of school, because that cannot happen. That cannot happen. It's against the law. They should have to leave the school. But if you hear like people, you know, cussing and things like that, you're going to hear a lot of this, especially in high school. Just don't even, just ignore it completely. There, there's a term called taghafwal in Arabic. The Prophet says to them, he would practice taghafwal. Like, you know, just random noise happening. He would just pretend, you know, whatever. Just, just do, what you, do what you're doing. Don't necessarily dwell on what everyone is saying. Yeah. Hold on, I got to go for this. I got to go to the sisters. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, he did bring it to my attention. I did raise it with the teacher. Mm. And uh, my understanding is that the teacher did speak to the child. Mm. And a lot of this was happening at lunch. And the, the question I have for you, or, or just a, an observation, that um, there's a fine line between kids just being kids and kids speaking on other kids because of their race or religion. Yeah. So for me, when, when my kids talk to me, I, I try to keep the racism and the Islam out of it, and I talk to them as, this is general boys being boys, and we need to address it at that level. Yeah, that's also true, yeah. So I think we need to have that consciousness, because I think a lot of people um, in general from our background Often, anything that happens to them, they attribute it to racism. That's true as well. So, just a comment I heard from yes. this child and his friend just the other day uh -huh. on, on Friday night. They were at a school party. I was uh -huh. there, my friends were there. Yeah. And the kids were being very rowdy. They were using bad language. Mm -hmm. They were being rude to the parents and everything. There were no teachers there, it was just parents and travelers. Mm -hmm. And they get in the car with me, and I'm asking them, you know, how was your party and whatever, and they're telling me all these things. And one of the his friends made the statement, I think they were racist. And to me, yeah. that is, in general, for our community and our um, people from our background, we just tend to attribute everything that yeah. comes to us to racism. It's a cop out, yeah. No, I agree with you. And, and I think we, uh, we need to educate our, our children. Yes. And the way we talk to them, let's let's address the issue and keep the racism out. Exactly. And Unless something is explicitly racist. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody explicitly saying right. something about your religion or your background. Good. But other things that are happening is just kids being kids. It's, yeah, and oftentimes bo boys are penalized for being boys. You're absolutely right. right. Boys are rambunctious and they, they tend to bond by sort of slapping each other around. That's true. So things, So that's a very good point. And that's, I know this is true because my, my kids go to an all-Muslim school. And this happens amongst the boys. So obviously that's not racism. Because everyone's Muslim uh, and many of them are from the same ethnic background. So it is, it is so get down to the, 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 uh, the specific incident. Why is it happening? If someone's calling you a terrorist and then hitting you, well, that's something very different than, you know, just sort of, you know, boys sort of, you know, slapping each other around because they're boys. I totally agree with you. And uh, very good point. Thank you very much. And that uh, we have to be uh, not so quick in you know, drawing the race card all the time. That's a very good point. Yeah. Yes, sister. Yes. Um, so my friend, she um, keeps being nice at first but then she keeps on picking on my other friend. Mm -hmm. You have a friend who picks on your other friend? Are they Muslims or no? Like, um, whenever my like, first friend, she goes to say an outing thing, and she just said, what's, what, what's that? And she didn't really respond, and she didn't really get in the business, and she doesn't really demand her to show her to show her, and just snap down and look at her. Yeah, just, just remind people to be, to be kind, you know. Just say, you know, that's not very nice. Give people advice. You know, sometimes, again, you know, children, most people here are children. Oftentimes they, you know, they all lack discipline sometimes. And there's, an, and there's an impulse control problem. So sometimes a child will do something, but they don't really mean harm by it. You know, it's just something that occurred to them, so they're going to do it. And I, have, I have a daughter like that. You know, who will just who just see something and, and go for it. Say, what are you doing? Oh, I, I didn't mean anything. So just remind them. And if it's getting worse, you know, um, 
you have to just keep reminding them and sit down and maybe just have a more serious conversation with them. Like, you know, this is hurting this person. And so, you know, you'll be surprised how far a, you know, just a good conversation will go. Communication is very important. People don't communicate anymore for some reason. You know, maybe it's because we live in an age, and it's not, you know, obviously to do with you, but um, this generation in general, the older generation, they don't tend to communicate face to face because the technology is sort of uh, limiting our face to face experiences. So people are very bold on the computer, they like to text, they don't even eat dinner together anymore. I mean, there, there are parents who don't, who don't see their children the whole day, not even for dinner. You know, when I was a kid, we were outside playing until Maghreb time, basically. But when we came home for dinner, we all had to sit at the table. You turn off the TV. My parents would ask me questions about my day, and, and I couldn't be like, they, if they're like, how's school? Uh, how was it? Uh, great. What did you do? Nothing. That wouldn't fly for me. My dad would be like, no, what do you mean nothing? What did you do? Uh, and then he'd sort of get into a conversation. So sitting down and just you know, having conversations with people, you know. Yes. Um, how come Christians hate so much? No, they don't hate. They don't. Hate, that's a stereotype. So that's that's not true. It's like saying it's like saying why do Muslims hate? Why are Muslims uh, terrorists? Why do Muslims hate America so much? It's just not true. My experience is the vast majority of Christians are beautiful, loving people. The vast, we're down to 99.9%. I've met a lot of Christians, you can imagine. I've been to hundreds of churches. Uh, I did my master's degree in the Bible, biblical studies. I've met Christian uh, professors and academics. Um, I'd say maybe in my entire life, I've come across one, two, or three hostile Christians. One, two, or three of them that were hostile. That's about it. You know, the vast, vast majority. So uh, the question itself to me is, is problematic. If your question is, why do some Christians hate Muslims? And that's true. There are some that hate uh, Muslims. And I think it's because, again, they've been, for lack of a better term, they've been brainwashed into thinking that Islam and Christianity are incompatible. Right? So there's a lot of churches in California that, that have a section on Islam in Sunday school. So the children there have to learn about Islam. And most of the time, the person who's teaching them is doing a good job. You know, they do their research, they even, sometimes they bring in a Muslim speaker, or it's sort of a junior pastor who speaks with Muslims and, and gets sources from Muslims and they teach them the best they can. Once in a while, you have someone who does a terrible job. Right? Uh, and gives them false information. And these are children, so they don't know. I mean, what are they going to say? There's an older person telling me these things. Why should I not believe him? Maybe it is true. So a lot of the children, unfortunately, they're being sort of brainwashed by adults who don't have sound knowledge. You know? Uh, yes? Yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, that, I had that experience too. I had teachers that were totally racist. My, my sixth grade teacher was so racist. She was actually, one time she actually pulled me by the ear and, and I had a teacher one time in second grade. I was at, when I was in second grade, we used to sit at these big tables, right? And uh, so there's other, there are other students there. And there was a German student next to me. And this German, uh, and this German guy, a student next to me, he drew this funny picture and he said, look, this is a bunch of Hebrews. He used the word Hebrews. And I just thought the word was, it, it sounded funny, Hebrew. So I drew the same picture and I said, these are Hebrews. But the teacher looked at our pictures and said, you have to stay after class to me. Right? And I go, okay, why? I didn't know what a Hebrew was. I just thought the word sounded funny. Like, um, um, what's a funny sounding word? No, something else. Monkey. Wembasso. Bamboozle. Like someone said, bamboozle. I go around, bamboozle, bamboozle. So Hebrew, Hebrew. Anyway, so the teacher said, she, she took me after class and she said, I know you're Iranian and your parents are telling you to hate Jews, but don't bring it into my class. 
And I started crying. I was, I was six years old. Because I was just so afraid, that, because the tone of the teacher was scary. I had no idea what she was talking about. And then I went home, and I had this Macmillan Dictionary for Children. I looked up the word Jew, and it said descendant of Judah. And I said, who's Judah? Forget it. I didn't even know what she was talking about. So there are racist teachers. That's absolutely true. So if you feel like your teacher is being racist, um, you know, you should talk to your parents. Have a very open line of communication with your parents. Don't be afraid of your parents. Your parents only want good for you. I promise you that. Your parents are never trying to hurt you. You know, you, you know, if you, if you know, my mom's trying to hurt me because she won't let me, you know, have four cookies. Well, that's, if you have more, if you have a lot of cookies, you're going to have a lot of sugar and you're going to gain a lot of weight. You're going to be all crazy. So that's good for you. Maybe we don't see how that's good for us, but it is good for us. Right? Our parents only want good. So sometimes we have to just trust our parents, right? Because they're our parents. Uh, so let your parents know if something like that happens. If you feel like a teacher is sliding you or is not, is not paying attention to you and you feel like there might be racism there, you know, then your parents will talk to the teacher and get down to the bottom of it. Sometimes maybe, hopefully it's nothing. It's just, you know, the teacher will say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I just, I was busy or I was, you know, depressed or something. I was thinking about my laundry or something like that. <laughs> Whatever it was. Yes? So you know what you can do? You can, you can tell them about your religion. Just, just tell them. You don't have to have this big like speech in class or something. But just informally, you can just, you can just tell them you know, why, why I believe this. This is what it is. It's very similar. You, you can say, you know, I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. I have actually a t-shirt that says, like all Muslims, I love Jesus. And I wear, I wear this shirt in public sometimes. And you'll be amazed the response I get from people. There are people who do like a triple take. You know what a triple take is? Nope. It's like it's eagle, I guess. Like triple. Like, like whoa. And then people come up to me, is this a joke? That's what they say sometimes. Are you mocking Jesus? What do you mean? You're a Muslim. Obviously, this is a joke. No, I love Jesus. What do you mean? Well, he's a prophet in Islam. Oh, he is? Wow! That's so cool, man! <laughs> so talk to people about, and maybe even bring them to the mus masjid. Show them the masjid. If there's an event at the masjid, you know, where there's a you know a younger speaker who's dynamic, and you know, bring them. Don't be afraid to invite people. Yes, sir. He's had his hand up for a long time, and he's. <laughs> What's your name? Which? Huh? Tarek. Masha. Go ahead, Tarek. Um. There was a teacher in my school. It's not my teacher, but there was a teacher who, like, I don't know what grade, but she used to, like, hit kids like, uh, with that ruler right. or something. That's abuse. Right. In, your, in the public school? She's like a, yeah, in the public school. Really? She's yeah. yeah. She's not there anymore? Yeah, no. That's probably why you're not there. That's probably why. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a good idea to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so she's gone, so that's, a, you know, it's good that they got rid of her. I'm glad. Mashallah. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, so what will we do if racism grows now that we have, you know, a racist president? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. That's so true. Well, whether, whether he's racist or not is open to debate. I would, I would be very reluctant to label someone a racist, you know, unless there's something just very explicitly coming, very, something very explicitly racist about what a person is saying. Um, so one can make the argument, however, that, you know, a Muslim ban from these countries is, is a demonstration of racism. So one can make the case. I, I personally wouldn't label him a racist, but I think he um, makes statements that are uh, unproductive and irresponsible. You know, to say, I mean, he said this, Islam hates us. He said, I think Islam hates us. So you gotta think about this for a minute. Who's us? What is he talking about? What does he mean by us? 
America. America, right? So Islam hates America, but I'm an American. So does Islam hate me? I'm Muslim. Do I hate myself? Do I hate myself? No, so the, the statement makes no sense. It's very polarizing. I just don't think he knows any better. I don't think he's trying to be explicitly racist. I just think he's not very bright. He's not very polished, right? That's why a lot of people actually voted for him, is because he doesn't sound like a politician. You know, Obama's like, hey, he's very you know, suave, and how's it going? Because he's a politician. Hill Clinton is a politician. They know what to say, and what they say sometimes does not match their actions, right? But what people find refreshing about Trump is, he, he, he says what he thinks, and oftentimes, you know, he doesn't really think things tr through, but I, I won't necessarily say it's uh, explicitly racist. But, you know, this is, we should look at this as an opportunity to engage, in, engage with people and educate them. You know, it's, it's something we, it's, there's something good that can come out of this. You know, um, I don't know if there's organizations here, but in California there's an organization called uh, ING, Islamic Networks Group, and then they'll fly out here, where they actually give presentations in public schools about Islam. And I tell you, when they go to these schools, there's an entire paradigm shift. I mean, I mean, it's just, it, everyone just sort of wakes up to the reality of what this religion is. They talk to the entire school, you know. And maybe something like that needs to happen at a lot of these schools, uh, to actually hear from um, uh, established Muslim organizations. And, you know, even the teachers and administrators, they attend these events and it's eye-opening for them. You know, so it's, I think it's badly needed in these times because there, yeah, I mean, there's the rhetoric is increasing, but I look at that as a, I look at that as a teaching opportunity. Yes, ma'am. So now we focus on women and women and women. So I don't think we should hide that women's room. We should be proud because we really know what Islam is. So can you tell us how can we be proud about it? Yeah, is what I said earlier. So the Prophet said, uh, he was asked by a companion. Uh, he said, give me some advice. And he said, He said, speak the truth, even if it's bitter. Right? Sometimes the truth for people is bitter. They don't want to hear it. It hits their nafs or something. And then he said, and don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of the reproaches of human beings. You know, be Muslim, be principled. Remember I talked about that? Assertive nonviolence. Don't be violent, but be a principled person. And that's how, you be, that's how you can be a proud Muslim. Proud, not in the sense of kibr. We don't like kibr. Kibr is arrogance. Don't be arrogant, right? Be humble, have tawadur. Be humble, but also be proud in the sense that, in the sense that you're not afraid of being Muslim. You're not, you're not ashamed of being Muslim. You know, you, you don't eat pork, you're not ashamed to, to admit that, you don't drink wine, you don't go out uh, partying in haram ways. We have fun, but we have halal fun. Uh, we pray, we listen to our parents. People actually respect that. People don't respect someone who is sort of wishy-washy, to be honest with you. You'll learn as adults that people, even if they disagree, people respect people who are principled, even if they're principled in positions that disagree with them. You know, when I got my, I was an accountant a long time ago, out of, out of college, when I was 21 years old, I became an accountant. And this company hired me, and they also hired a CFO. You know what CFO is? A chief financial officer, someone who's way up there. Basically, the boss of my boss. So they took me and the new CFO out to lunch, and it was during Ramadan. So at this point, I could have gone, oh, you know, maybe I'll just eat lunch because I don't want them to know I'm Muslim. And then they're going to start asking me questions, and what if they start talking about terrorism? And ah. So anyway, they said, what will you have? And I said, oh, I'm fasting. Right? And then I noticed that the CFO, because he was Jewish, he took out his crackers, right, because it was Passover. So he can't eat, you know, he can't eat certain types of food. So there's a sort of partial fast that he was, he was doing. So he said, oh, you're fasting. So we just started talking, me and the CFO. And it turned into an incredible friendship. And every so often the CFO would call me into his office and we'd just talk about like football or something. And the other accountants were so jealous of me. And then he'd just, you know, give me a raise, you know, a pay raise every so often. 
Because I had this incredible relationship with them because I took a stand and I said, look, I'm Muslim and I'm fasting. So don't forget, Allah is in charge of everything. Allah is in charge of everything. Right? So Allah tells us to do something, we do something. We don't say, well, you know, what if this person is going to make fun of me or something? Allah is in charge of everything. So there's a Quranic verse that says, if you give victory to God, meaning follow what God tells you to do, He will give you victory. Right? And He will plant your feet firmly, meaning that He'll give you strong principles and give you courage. Right? So don't be afraid. You know, if you're praying and somebody says, oh, you pray. There was, a, there was a high school student one time. He said, he was on the football team, Muslim on the high school football team. The only Muslim on the high school football team. And he said, you know, the, the, it, it, at that high school, all the high school football players, they wear their jerseys on Friday and they all sit together for lunch. And he said there was, this, uh, there was a lunch line in front, in front of him and there was a, a girl with hijab who was standing in the lunch line. He said another football player went up behind her and started tugging the back of her hijab. And she kept going like this. And she was just like terrified look on her face. Like someone's gonna pull off my hijab. Just to kind of you know, mess with her a little bit. So this brother, I said, what did you do? He said, I didn't do anything. I did nothing. I let it happen. Because I didn't want him to know I was also Muslim. And I said, you failed. You failed. So you should find her and apologize to her. And that's what he did. He went up to her a few days later and he said, you know, I saw what happened to you at lunch and I'm sorry I didn't intervene. I promise it'll never happen again. You know, so we have to protect each other. Be principled. Don't worry about what this guy's going to think about you. What are you talking about, man? She's a terrorist. Oh yeah, she's a terrorist. I'm Muslim too. Oh, you are? Sorry, Abdul. Yes. I N G. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I think ing.org. Um, the uh, the the two Muslim sisters that run the organization are Maha Al Ghanedi and uh, Mina Jandali. So they do presentations all around the country, and I'll tell you, it's it's really incredible the response they get. I mean, it just it just turns people 180 uh, percent degrees. It will make a big difference, and they're not afraid to tackle issues. Like they'll engage the students, and they'll talk about you know important issues that that are on students' minds. So they don't sugarcoat anything. It's not boring. It's very engaging. It's very relevant. So I highly recommend that. Yeah. That are not acceptable by like schools Yeah. Well we should we should make the we should be assertive that the hijab is not cultural, it's religious. And you have religious freedom. Yeah. Right? That's number one. And if that doesn't fly, go to a different school. You know, it's difficult sometimes. You know, just go to a different school. If you feel if you feel that your dean is in danger in America, make hijrah. And that's always an option. Seriously, it's an option. You know, but try the best you can. But that's that's how we should frame the argument. And it's not a lie. It is a religious symbol. It's not a cultural. So for some people, it is cultural, right? But the reason that you're doing it is for a religious reason. So make that point. So it's a, you can demand. If I have to take off my hijab, then no Christian can wear a cross. No Jews can wear yarmulkes. It's a religious symbol. It's not my culture. ING, Islamic Networks Group, Islamic Networks Group. Because I want to, um, to get the knowledge, in, especially in teenagers, because yeah. sometimes mock her or just say to her, like, 
you cannot hear because you're wearing this thing on your head. So yeah, I said, do you wear that in the shower? <laughs> or sometimes they come to my, my wife. They, a lot of people assume my wife doesn't speak English. So we'll be at a restaurant and uh, the, the waiter will say, what would you like, sir? And I order and she goes, okay, what does she want? So why don't you ask her, oh, okay. <laughs> say, Believe me, she speaks English. I know firsthand. Yes? Do you know, like this once happened to me? What do you do when someone is like bullying you and then like there's a lot of people that's like that's coming up to you and standing with him? Standing with him? Yeah. <laughs> Just try to get out of that situation. Keep keep moving. Don't don't let yourself get cornered. Because that's, that's what a bully does. People like, unfortunately, especially children, but people in general, they like to see a conflict. People love fights. They want to see a fight. That's why, you know, you know these, uh, yeah, th that's the best part of the hockey game. Or, you know, these, um, the UFC. When I, was, when I was a kid, UFC was, you had to pay to watch UFC. Now it's everywhere. You can watch it on regular television because it's so popular. People love to see fights, right? So people start taking out their phones and recording you. So if you feel like someone's bullying you, just get away from that situation as, as, and move away as far as you can. Don't let it sort of turn into a scene. Even if the person like pushing you, just you know, run, run away. Then he thinks that you're scared. Then you, you, that's what I'm saying. If you're, if you're being bullied by this person, tell an administrator, run to the principal and, and tell them what's happening and then go home and tell your parents. So don't run away, but don't let it go. First, you have to tell the teacher. How about if the teacher doesn't let you go to that? You know, that place. Go uh, tell your parents. So your parents should take it seriously. And yeah, this is a situation of you're being bullied outside. And so yeah, obviously there is a situation of, you know, boys bonding and boys are rambunctious. And that's, but this is a different situation. This is when you're being pursued and there's a, there's a threat on your physical person. So tell the teacher and then tell your parents and let your parents deal with the school. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Uh, like, let's say, um, like, you know the class, like, pet or something like yeah. that? Let's say, like, the class pet is bullying you when you go to the teacher, like, you say, the class pet, pet is bullying you? No, whatever. Like, the teacher's pet. The teacher's pet is doing what? It's like bullying you or something. What's the uh. Oh. Yeah. Like, when you let the teacher like some rod, and then you tell the teacher, but then the teacher is like, no, this kid is really nice. You wouldn't be doing any sort of thing. You wouldn't reply or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's a teacher's pet. Yeah. Well, again, you can go, just tell your parents about that. Let your parents handle that situation. It might be nothing. It just it just might be. A lot. Oftentimes, what's that? Yeah, again, that's that's sort of that's that could be just boy behavior. Boy, boys do things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's happening. Tell your parents. So your parents can contact the school and get to down to the bottom of why he's doing that. Not necessarily, you know, if a, a, a teacher is dealing with a parent, they have to be very careful and they know they have to be very careful. But if they're dealing with you, they, they can sort of brush you off a little bit. But always have, again, it's very important, listen up children, having a very open line of communication with your parents is extremely important. You know, so when you're eating dinner, eat dinner with your parents. Don't go upstairs and TV, nothing. Eat dinner with your parents, and when your parents ask you, how was your day, tell them what happened during school. Tell them these things. Let them know. It's only for your benefit. Your parents will never try to hurt you. It's only trying to benefit you, only trying to help you. Yes? You get what? Uh. Dua. Yes. So call, call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, Ya Qawi, Ya Qawi. Learn these names of Allah. Ya Qawi means, Oh strong one. Oh, Ya Qadir, Oh omnipotent one. You know, the, the one who's all powerful. So we should always be speaking to God. 
When we feel weak and vulnerable, call on Allah's names of power and ask Allah, give me strength. And if there's like a disaster happening or something, call on Allah's names of gentle, Ya Latif, O gentle one, make this easy. So we should, we should know these names of God. So be in, a, be in a state of dua. Everyone has anxiety. It's a normal thing. Whenever I speak, I get anxiety. And people think, well, no, you seem like you're so comfortable. I, my heart starts racing. And I, I think, what if I forget what to say? What if they make fun of me? What if I trip? Uh, what if my zipper's down? You know, what if uh, I start spitting all over the place? All these kind of thoughts go through your mind, right? So that's normal. But then you have to remember that you're Muslim. And, you know, uh, dua is speaking with Allah, and dua is very powerful. You know, so take a moment, take a deep breath, call on Allah, and do what you think is right. You know, and as you get older, you'll notice that it becomes easier. You know, but that's normal. Everyone gets anxiety. You know, it's a, it's a good thing. It actually helps us focus more. <laughs> Um, what is the best answer when they ask? Um, what does that sound? <laughs> oh, it's a little. <laughs> yeah. So, picking up the um, what's the thing when people ask them, why do they dress differently? Yeah. Yeah, you can say that um, I, I dress modestly because I want to be a modest person. You know, so deal with me intellectually. Don't worry about my, my, my physicality. What does it matter what I look like physically? You know, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, the, it's a principle of being an American that we don't discriminate based on race and creed, you know, physical appearance. Uh, so make it clear that this is how I choose to dress. Um, so don't worry about me physically. Deal with my mind. Let's see if you can engage my mind. Right? And modesty is a very beautiful thing. And I'll, know that I'll tell you this. This is my experience. I've taught undergraduate students in college, and I've taught graduate students, and I've been in PhD seminars. The, uh, the younger students are, the more immodest they dress. The younger they are, the more in, in, is that the word, immodest? The, the less modestly they dress. But the older they are, the more educated they are, suddenly they get more covered. <laughs> That's just what I noticed. Like, I, I, you know, being an undergraduate class with non-Muslim women, and everyone's half naked. And then in a PhD seminar, they're almost all co completely covered. And the men are like that too. Why does that happen? It seems like there's a correlation in my mind between education and modesty. That's just what I've noticed. You know? So people will eventually get to that, inshallah, when they get older. But you can say, you know, I choose to dress modestly. This is my right. Um, this is what my personal preference. You don't even have to bring religion into it. This is my personal preference. You know? And so, so deal with my mind. Don't deal with my body. Huh? How about if you're like, like small, like if you're like in third, second grade, and yeah. there's like this tall guy, yeah, who's like fifth grade or something. How about if he starts bullying you and like goes unnecessary roughness on you? Unnecessary roughness? Yes, <laughs> like <laughs> whatever it's called. Yeah. Again, just let your teacher know. And then let your parents know. Tell your parents all about all these things. Okay. Keep telling your parents. Remember, take the takeaways from tonight, have dinner with your parents every night. And when your parents ask you about school, tell them everything. Everything that happened to you. Okay? Um, stay off social networks until you're in college. I know that's a tough one. But that's just my advice. You don't need, to, you don't need that stuff in high school. There's, there's too much to worry about. Um, and uh, it's, it's not a big issue. You don't, you don't need it. You, know. you can go online and get the news if you want. You can go to your friends' houses and things like that. You can text people if you want. Uh, and then 
have an open line of communication with your parents and you have to know your parents only want to help you. They're not trying to harm you. Even if they disagree with you, the, their intention is never to harm you. Okay? So that's very, very important. So learn that lesson now. Because oftentimes, they're, they're, they're young people, they're children who, who clash with their parents and they say, you know, my, my dad just doesn't understand me and he's wrong and he's trying to do this and that. And then later on in life, when he's 30 years old, he'll look back and say, God bless my father. He, he only tried to, now I understand. And now he, my dad's, they say my dad already passed away. But he tried to help me and I didn't realize it back then. Right? So when you get older, you start to realize Right. That, that your parents have wisdom. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Even if you study and you're a genius and you're 15 years old, that knowledge is nowhere near the wisdom of your parents. Wisdom comes with age. You can't get wisdom through study, only through age. So wisdom trumps knowledge. So listen to the parents. This is very important. How many times in the Quran and Hadith does the Prophet say, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how many times do they say, you know, be kind to your parents, listen to your parents, obey your parents. There's a reason for that. Because your parents are really the only ones that really care about you. Nobody else really cares about you. Your parents are the only ones that really care about you. Yes? more teenage problems because they have a lot of questions with their child boss. Like for example, the parent has a relationship between teenagers. Um, here's a girl and she wanted to be like, if you can elaborate more problems on how teenager faces these days according to Islam. So they were really shy. Yeah, if, the, if there's, a, I would always recommend for high school students to have a Muslim club. You can go to the administrators of the school and they'll allow you to do that. I mean, there are Jewish clubs, there's Christian clubs. There should be a Muslim club. Uh, there should be a place where high school students that are Muslim can meet for Juma prayer or for a you know, club meeting where there's interaction between them. There's, there's social interaction. Um, so there's that sense of comfort, uh, leaning on each other. You know, strengthening each other. I think that has to be there in high school. There also has to be in intellectual engagement with non-Muslims in high school. It has to start in high school. It has to start earlier, but officially sort of in high school. So that you're actually putting on events in high school and inviting non-Muslims and engaging them. You know, atheists come. You should learn the arguments, the counter arguments of atheism. Christians will come. How to engage with Christians, with adab. You know, um, uh, whoever, you know, uh, you know the, the young Republicans on campus come, how to engage with them. You'll be surprised how much we have in common uh, with them. Highlight those commonalities. So high school, you should have a club, a Muslim club. There should be at least one time weekly meeting, you know. Yeah, and there should be intellectual engagement, official intellectual engagement with, with non-Muslims on, on campus. And there is a question that uh, sometimes it is hard to be a leader, like if you discuss with your parents, they yell at you. And if you don't discuss with your parents, they will yell at you more. That's, yeah, the parents have to be, we have to be very careful. Yeah, because she said that, like, if I am telling that I did this thing, and I know sometimes it's wrong, but the parents can understand me and they can, like, Relate to me. So, but, but should I do about how to communicate with my parents? Well, I'm trying my best, but sometimes words just doesn't come up in people's mind. How to talk to their parents? They are a little bit, especially U.S. teenagers. Like here, they are like, yeah, whatever. So that's her question. How she can be more humble and communicate, be able to communicate to them. Um, you know, oftentimes, like I said earlier, youth in, at high school or junior high level, uh, they should have some sort of mentor in their life as well. You know, there should be someone in the community who's closer to their age, or they can, who, someone that they can confide in if they feel uncomfortable speaking to their parents, or they're impatient when speaking to their parents. Um, so this community should have someone like that. But I would, again, just advise people to, um, you know, strive against those inclinations and do the best you can.
kindly of like parents and they saw him and they saw him out of their son, they'll kind of stop praying and they'll be lying about keeping and so forth. Um, so there's a comment about or a request for advice regarding someone, a son, adult son who has stopped praying and he is lying about keeping his prayers. Um, you know, he's an adult, so, you know, you have to obviously keep advising him, you know. Um, so, um, and it's unfortunate that that happened. You know, so it doesn't seem like he maybe had a strong foundation. But, you know, it's not, it's, at this point, it's no longer um, useful to play the, the blame game. And, you know, oh, it's because the parents, they didn't, you know, they... Oftentimes what happens, though, to be honest with you, is that young people, they want to actually start praying and going to the masjid. And then the parents, they say, no, you, you have to finish school first. Get your degree before you can pray. What? Before you can pray five times a day, you have to have your bachelor's degree. Which doesn't make any sense. Because the parents are like, you know, I don't want to become an extremist. And that's, that's a good intention. We shouldn't want our children to become extremists. Right? Uh, obviously. Um, but, you know, praying five times a day is not, in, not, is not extreme. So let your, let your children, if they have an inclination to pray, that's a beautiful thing. We have to trust Allah and His Messenger. And, you know, the Prophet says, let me say, children at 10 years old, they should be, you know, uh, they should be expected to start praying at that, at that age. So that when, when they're, you know, 15, 16, then it's just part of their daily practice. You know, uh, so I would I would give him just gentle reminders uh, that this is a good thing. And then oftentimes also what happens is you have parents giving advice to their children, but parents don't take that advice. You know, so like, you know, so you should pray, son. But and the child is thinking, you don't pray. I should pray. You don't pray. Or, you know, the, the father smoking a cigarette. Never smoke. This is terrible. <laughs> you know. So that doesn't mean that the, the advice is not good. It is good advice. Again, parents, they give good advice, right? And their intentions are always good, right? The, the, the ulama say, the intention of a believer is always better than his action. He intends good things, but the actions sometimes fall full, short. And they say that the action of the hypocrite is always better than his intention. So a hypocrite is doing great things outwardly, but the intention is wrong. So believers are going to fall short in their actions, in other words. Um, but we have to be very careful as parents that we practice what we're preaching, right? Um, so, uh, and if you want to, you know, uh, request or recommend to the adults on certain scholars that they can listen to, then maybe you, you think they'll find sort of uh, beneficial or um, uh, um, what's the word? Um, someone that they can uh, relate to, someone who's relevant. You know, you, you, you see a speech or a lecture on the internet, forward it to them. You know, so she's going like this. <laughs> uh huh, go ahead. What was the question? How do you stay away from people? Don't don't hang around them. Just don't hang around them. Everyone has bad influences. It might be your cousin, right? So maybe you're like, well, I have to see them once a week. They come over to my house. Okay, see them. Be kind. You know, uh, engage with them. Have a hamburger. And then that's it. You know. So I have a lot of relatives that are extremely anti-Muslim. Uh, and, you know, my engagement with them is minimal, but it's courteous. You don't have to make them your best friend. Just don't hang around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I mean, I think I, I covered that earlier. Try to ignore it as much as possible, and if it can it persists, uh, and analyze what they're saying, and respond to them intellectually. Make them think about what they're saying. Have them justify what they're saying. And that's it. So I think we have to stop now, because it's almost over time.
So thank you for your questions. Um, and we'll uh, see you soon, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.